Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, our third season, which focuses on citizenship. Um, in, our first, uh, in our first show, we talked to Adrian Clarkson, the former Governor General of, of Canada, to talk about a, a more practical application of, of citizenship in Canada. Uh, and we've also spoken to Jelani Cobb, the New Yorker writer and uh, Columbia University journalism professor about citizenship and race and identity in Biden's America. Uh, for this show, we are going back to basics. We want to try and define what citizenship means, both historically and in the modern world, what it could mean, what it might mean, of course, in the future. And today we're talking with Richard Bellamy. He's uh, a professor at University College London, a distinguished uh, professor of political thought, of political theory. And he's the author of Citizenship, a very short introduction. In, in the first sentence of your book, Richard, your, your first sentence of a very short introduction to citizenship, you say interest in citizenship has never been higher. So why do you think today we're so fascinated, perhaps even obsessed with the idea of citizenship? Well, in some ways, and, and this is also a theme of, of the book to a, to a degree, I think we're interested in it for, the, for bad reasons. So I think that uh, there's been uh, a tendency since the the 1980s in particular, the, the, the Thatcher-Reagan era, as it were, to uh, move from thinking that the, the state has a responsibility to its citizens, to a view that citizens have a responsibility to do things that the state used to do, and which they used to push the state to do. And uh, I think that's been a... Um, one of the reasons why citizenship has been looked at as a sort of uh, panacea of all issues. It's, it's putting the responsibility onto us. One sees this, for example, at, at present in the UK, the government uh, dealing with a, a, an unprecedented crisis and, and now reaching the terrible uh, uh, mark of of a hundred thousand deaths from from COVID, and no uh, doubt that hundred thousand will be higher, unfortunately, tragically, by yeah. the time people watch. Them. Exactly, exactly, and uh, they've been suggesting that in part it's because people haven't been behaving. They've been uh, have it going out and and uh, having parties. They haven't been social distancing, and although there's been some of that, it's really been at the margins. And I think that that's a good example of how people invoke citizenship, people in government, etc., as a way of, of uh, explaining what are really policy failures on the part of the state. Richard, I think in your book, you describe that as the, the paradox of citizenship. And citizenship, of course, is riddled with paradoxes. But before we focus on those paradoxes, perhaps you might, as a good academic, as one of the world's leading authorities on citizenship, quite briefly and simply define in your mind what this word citizenship means. Well, I think, I mean, in a way, to capture what's distinctive about it, it's useful to compare it with membership, subjecthood, and neighborliness. Uh, so lots of people are, are members of associations like uh, the automobile association. Uh, but there they, they pay a fee and they get a service. It doesn't require anything of them. And in, in the UK, we are still technically subjects of Her Britannic Majesty. Uh, and that means that we're subject to the law, but we were just there to obey it, as it were, and do, do our bit. Um, and then neighbors, obviously that's uh, an important virtue. Uh, again, during this crisis, lots of people are, are 
doing their bit to help out, I don't know, an elderly neighbor by getting their shopping or something like that. But it's a, it's a moral charitable obligation. Right, so being yeah. a good neighbor doesn't necessarily mean being a good citizen. Those are two quite yeah. different things. Exactly. Citizenship has elements of all of those things. If you're a member of a certain political community and you have certain duties that come with that, but you're not a subject, you're, you're also a participant in shaping that community and in uh, performing certain important practices uh, uh, within it to, to sustain that, that community. And you have certain uh, obligations of solidarity to your, to your, your uh, fellow citizens, but they're obligations in part of, of justice to try and ensure that, that, for example, people by right have certain welfare and medical insurance and so forth. It's not just a matter of the charity of one person to another as a good neighbor, a good Samaritan or whatever. So I think citizenship has this distinctive element of being an active, equal participant in sustaining cooperative and collective goods within your political community. A wonderfully crisp, sharp definition of, of what citizenship mm -hmm. is. Uh, one, of, one of the other things I really liked about your book, which is short and, 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 and sharp, but also quite detailed, is that you present different conceptions of citizenship over time. And you show that the birth of citizenship actually doesn't have much to do with democracy. Uh, in 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 the antiquity of Greece and yeah. uh, Rome, is that fair? Yes, I think that that that's right. It, I mean, it was something that was um, a privilege. Uh, so, you know, in Greece, those the population was largely made up of of slaves. Um, so they were supporting the activity of of citizenship by um, sort of doing all of the jobs which were required to feed the people and and to to make the households run along with with women who are also excluded and so it's a kind of aristocracy that um it was a more only privileged people would have the rights and indeed the responsibilities of citizenship yes yes which isn't to say that there weren't even amongst the citizens a group who were aristocrats who looked down on on spreading the vote uh, even amongst uh, a broader but still very limited cast of, of, of people. But, uh, but yes, that, that, that sort of gave us our original ideas. And then the issue is how extendable is that to, to everybody? Within and it the seems as if the two key relatively modern political thinkers who took the notions of antiquity, of citizenship in antiquity, and modernized it, got it prepared in some ways for this convergence of democracy and citizenship were Machiavelli and Rousseau. Is that fair? Um, yes, I mean, I suppose uh, not everybody would necessarily think so, but- But, but you my, seem to suggest uh, that in, in your book. Yeah, they're my heroes, that's right. Why because, are they your heroes, Richard? Because they're- because they're proponents of citizenship or because they are uh, uh, pioneers of democracy? Well, both, I think. Uh, so I think it's because both of them take the view that if you want to have the state serving the interests of the people, then you've got to empower them. Uh, so in, in Machiavellian's case, it was empowered them also by, um, you get the origin of what is a big problem in the United States, the right to bear arms. You had citizen <laughs> armies because he thought, uh, if you give an army to, to the prince, then they're gonna use it as much to oppress the people as to uh, defend them. Uh, and, uh, but it was also went together with uh, a huge emphasis on civic virtue. And likewise, Rousseau picks up this element and 
sees what's important in, in um, citizenship is the taking part in public decision-making and doing so in a way which again is orientated not towards maximizing your self-interest, which he saw as a market uh, virtue as it were, but rather maximizing the public good, the common good of all citizens in an equal way. Would it be fair to say that Rousseau and Machiavelli and others, of course, took a, a rather narrow, privileged notion, anti-democratic notion of citizenship in antiquity and expanded it, modernized it, made it applicable for everybody? That's right. I think that was a, 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 a distinctive feature of what they were trying to do, yeah. And it seems like in your book, you suggest that the history of citizenship and indeed of democracy and politics over the last two or 300 years has been a, a series of, of what you call class struggles to, um, to, to, to broaden citizenship in economic, cultural, racial and gendered terms. Is that one way of thinking of the history of citizenship? Yes, I mean, you know, one's only got to think of, of um, female suffrage. I mean, that really wasn't a achieved in most democracies until after the First World War, and in some democracies like Switzerland, not till as late as the 1970s. So that's been a, a long struggle and still an ongoing struggle uh, in the sense that when one looks at the representation of women within uh, most representative assemblies, uh, it's only in a few, mainly Scandinavian countries, that it's anything like 50 uh, percent. The, the paradox or another paradox of citizenship, of course, is as it's expanded in theory, ideally over the last 200 years, it's also narrowed because of the problems of ethnicity and identity and the emergence of nationalism. Is nationalism and a kind of universal citizenship, are they antithetical? Are they incompatible? Um, I don't think necessarily. I mean, in, in the sense that if you understand nationalism as a kind of civic culture, uh, as you know, more akin to patriotism, shall we say, rather than defined by ethnicity or um, some other uh, marker, then I don't think it is necessarily antithetical to, to universal uh, citizenship. Can we get to a, a, a post-ethnic, post-racial notion of citizenship by looking, you, you look at the Belgian model. Are there models out there? Maybe Belgium, maybe Canada, perhaps Australia, which do this successfully? But I think surely Canada, to the extent it's been successful, has done so by making um, a big show of its multiculturalism. I mean, not always uh, satisfactorily, but... Uh, well, say more, <laughs> Richard. So you're saying the show isn't real, it's all appearance and no reality? No, I don't, I don't think that is the case. Uh, but I think, well, obviously there have in the not so distant past been problems with its own indigenous population. Now there is much more of a, of a recognition of, of that kind of history. Um, and yeah, it's become a, a much more multicultural society through it's embracing uh, quite a high degree of immigration. So it's, it's a changing society, but you know, there have been difficulties, uh, particularly in Quebec, uh, over um, Muslim communities, for example, as a, a sort of vulgar French Republican model going on there uh, very often. Um, so it's, it's work in progress, but I don't see that necessarily as a bad thing. As I, you know, you rightly pointed out that I, I've argued that we've had these various struggles. And I think 
recognizing it and having these ongoing struggles is something we're never going to get. So there's, there's no, in, in other words, there's no end of history when it comes to citizenship. There's no end of history. It's always no. an unfolding narrative. You note in the book, Richard, that one of the great crises of citizenship in, in, in the early part of the 21st century is associated with capitalism and inequality. In our second series, we have indeed focused on this relationship mm, between mm. capitalism and democracy. Why is the inequalities of globalized capitalism, why is, can it be so problematic for the idea of citizenship? It's always a complicated story, as I think a number of your um, contributors, because I did watch some of those, those programs with great interest, uh, pointed out. So, you know, on the one hand, globalized capitalism has uh, often benefited uh, some of the poorest in the world. So, uh, uh, so it, to that extent, it's, it's not been all bad news. I mean, it's been principally in lifting up the populations of, of India and China in, in particular. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's, it's gone, a, I mean, global capitalism for a long period worked through a formula that uh, someone said, described as, as Adam Smith abroad and Keynes at home. In other words, uh, the free market of exchanges between states was bolstered by social protection within states, although that social protection was often very uneven because developing states often did not have that. What happened in the, in the uh, 1980s, after the financial problems of the 1970s, was that there was an, one got both Smith abroad and, and Smith at home, or Hayek at home anyway, mm. and, and, and dismantling of those welfare protections mm. uh, and even greater disparities between rich countries and poor countries and between the very rich within the rich countries and the very poor within the rich countries. And uh, that went hand in hand with a sort of dismantling of the state and uh, a shift to a view of citizenship as being, on the one hand, you could be a member of the club or not a member of the club. And on the other, it was all down to being a good neighbor and sorting things out yourself uh, and a huge emphasis on individual responsibility rather than res solidarity between equals. And I think, you know, it's that difficulty that we now are having to confront. We need to rebuild uh, a public infrastructures within our societies and rebuild political citizenship and responsibility for those public uh, infrastructures, I think. Um, you seem to suggest in your short introduction that the major crisis of citizenship in the early part of the 21st century is associated with the destruction of public space and the privatization of everything. So that yes. citizens, even if they might vote in the same system, actually share very little in common. For example, people now live on private estates. They send their children to private schools. They rely on private health care. It seems as if we are, as individuals, as political subjects, confusing mm. or all too often confusing being consumers and citizens. And many people forget that being a citizen is not just about rights, but also responsibilities. You, you write with R R R uh, W R I T E. You write in your book about the right to rights, and you seem yeah. to be slightly suspicious of this idea. Is another of the challenges of of, of rejuvenating, of revitalizing, of reinventing citizenship in the twenty first century, of of gently or perhaps not so gently reminding people that as citizens, they don't just have rights, they have responsibilities and they can't just be citizens and uh, consumers and endlessly complain. Politics is not just about being on amazon.com and getting overnight deliveries. No, no, absolutely. I, um, 
Well, I think, you know, one, one duty is to accept higher rates of taxation, for example, to, to fund what you want. I mean, if you want to make loads of demands on, on the state uh, and to have a, 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 a better infrastructure, then one has to accept uh, contributing to that. Um, one has to accept to a, a degree of equality with your fellow citizens and understand that, you know, there's no such thing as a self-made entrepreneur. Uh, entrepreneurs, they may have one good idea and seize an opportunity, but they're able to do that because there's, uh, there's a whole infrastructure and a po other population which supports them in that end endeavor. And so- that, uh, That's uh, an argument I think that you're, you're I, I don't know if she's still at UCL, she was at UCL, the, the economist Mariana Mezzacciuto has, has, has reminded us of when it comes right. to technology, it's an important lesson, of course. Exactly. So I think all of these, you know, these issues are, are there. So it's about, yes, having a certain responsibility towards other people, also recognizing how one's achievements in a way <laughs> depend upon all of those other people as well. It's, it's understanding that we're in, engaged in, in a sort of scheme of social cooperation together. And, and we have a political responsibility for maintaining that scheme and, and ensuring its, its equity. Isn't the point of a representative democracy that we leave it up to the experts, that I don't have to waste my valuable leisure time worrying about the local water supply or electric supply in, in a small town? In a famous essay, the, the French liberal thinker, Benjamin Constant, talked about the liberties of the ancients and the liberties of the moderns. And he argued that the free market and Adam Smith had shown that, you know, that partly the liberties of the moderns were about having the right to pursue your own life, uh, the pursuit of happiness, uh, life and liberty, uh, and, and indulging in a private life, which we, we value, but the ancients did not. But he also said, we're not going to maintain that possibility for private liberty if we don't have a, a little bit of ancient liberty too, if we don't have at least some recognition of our, our need to participate to, to, together. And, um, and he saw representative you know, democracy as precisely having this potential, this potential uh, mix. Are you an enthusiast of uh, innovative programs like citizen assemblies? Is this one oh. way that we can revitalize the yeah. ideal, the ideal of citizenship in antiquity in a modern democratic context? <sighs> Actually, I'm a little skeptical about uh, citizen assemblies. I, oh, I good. Think. I like that. Uh, I think, you know, Ireland is, is somewhere where uh, one might want to point to a certain success with the uh, referenda uh, on abortion and, and uh, gay marriage um, there. But I think that those... Those were results of a change in the social morality of, of Ireland, um, uh, which has occurred over the past 10 years. And I think the virtue of those citizen assemblies was not in changing the views of citizens, but by alerting politicians that, um, that uh, people's views had, had changed, that social uh, morality had altered on, on those two issues beyond uh, the restrictions of, of, of Catholic uh, ideology of, of the past. Um, I, I think that it's, it's, it's got to be much more basic. It's about sort of uh, improving the 
uh, electoral system and the party system and people's involved in voting, it's having the possibility for uh, economic democracy uh, uh, and, and people being able to, to actually uh, claim some rights in the workplace, which ensures that, that they can also uh, force on uh, big companies and uh, very wealthy entrepreneurs changes and fairer redistribution of wealth within those enterprises. I mean, uh, and getting those things right, it can be very difficult. I mean, again, for all wants to look at Ireland. Ireland, you know, at one level has a, a beautiful electoral system, it's very proportional, etc. And yet, in the context of Ireland, that's resulted in a form of politics, which is basically pork, but local pork barrel politics. It's devoid really of ideological divisions at all. It's not really responsive to general changes in, in the public, which is why you've got, despite Ireland having become a very wealthy country in, the, uh, in recent years, it, it has uh, a huge inequality within that. that so country. a technocracy takes the spirit, the blood out of citizenship. It does, but also, you know, localism, over localism can also take the blood out of out of uh, democracy. I think it's also a problem in in the United States, where where uh, many uh, representatives are basically just there to 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 get various bits of pork brought back to to their, their locality and aren't really engaged in thinking about the public infrastructure of the country uh, as a as a whole and i think that's a you know politics has, has got to mean something and one way of making it mean something is it really does lead to people rethinking what the what the state should be doing, how the, how services should be provided, what the tax regimes should be in order to benefit the people as a whole, and that's that's something which has been has been going from from politics. But I I hope will begin to come back. Well, Richard Bellamy, a real honor, real pleasure to talk to you. I appreciate your honesty and. And your ability to move rooms with such sophisticated <laughs> grace. Thank you so much. No, no, thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it too.